Welcome to tonight's episode of Beyond Focus TV. I'm Lydia Patel, and as always, I have a very special guest for you, Michelle Barnes Anderson, founder and CEO of the Melquan Jatel Anderson Foundation. She'll be with us for the next 30 minutes, so stay with us. You're watching Beyond Focus TV. Beyond Focus TV allows you to discuss contemporary topics affecting the Caribbean people on both the national and local level. The show features informed guests who offer insight, debate, and evaluate various issues. Beyond Focus TV builds on the station's mission to provide useful information to the Caribbean people in New York and abroad. Beyond Focus TV, where our viewing audience can get educated, informed, and empowered. Welcome back. You're watching Beyond Focus TV. I'm Lydia Patel. And like I said, I have a very special guest for you, Michelle Barnes Anderson. Welcome to the program. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's an honor to be here. I appreciate you having me come on the show, tell my stories, about things that I do we for the community. It. We love it. And, and thank you because it's such an interesting story. And we really want everybody at home to, to really get to know more. So before we dive thank into you. it, I always start off with everybody who's in the hot seat is who is. So who is Michelle Barnes Anderson? Well, Michelle Barnes Anderson, born and raised in Brooklyn. Um, I'm from the NYSHA Projects Farragut Housing Complex. So my mom lived there. She still lives there over 50 years. We have 50 years of history wow. there. So although I didn't live there anymore, I still raised my son out there because this 50 years of history of the community being out there with my parents. So I went to John Jay CUNY College. I went to John Jay College. I got my master's, my bachelor's, everything from there. I have a bachelor's in forensic um, psychology, and I have my master's in public administration, inspector general, and criminal justice. And I did all of that because I started, I went to school late. I went to college and then I had my son, so I stopped. But then when he became a teenager, I went back to school. Nothing wrong with that. So <laughs> it was more so getting things because I had a young black male and I wanted to make sure that I would raise him the right way and be able to have the tools if anything ever came around. Never would I would have thought that I would have been using my education to try to save other people's children because mine is gone. And that's such a. It's so disheartening to hear that, but in one sense, it's like you were almost repressed to a certain degree. Like, imagine going through this process as an uneducated person or someone who may be educated but in a totally different field and not able to do that. But let's give the audience a little bit. Tell us your story. Tell us about your son and, and what led up to everything. Well, my son, he was my only child, and... It was just my son and I for so many years, although, you know, it started out with my son and I and our, his father, you know, we were married, but then we separated and things went away where I was a single parent mm -hmm. and I was raising him with my mom, going to the community, making sure that he has that roots there as well. And he had a little trouble in life. It was a struggle at first, you know, not so much of hanging out in the streets or anything like that, but just mischievous being a kid. And he winds up going away to a facility and when he was a teenager and um it was like a he had to come home on weekends and come and he, he came home on weekends and he went there. But I got him into co I got him into he got a GED and then he actually came home, got into college and that was his thing. He would help people try to get a GED because he did so well with getting his own GED wow. that he actually started prepping students to take the GED program. So when he got murdered, it was actually coming from my four days after his twenty seventh birthday coming from my mom's house on his way home and he had school that day so he had a paper in his pocket about social justice and <laughs> the community and I got the phone call that he got murdered and I lost I lost my mind I didn't know what to do with that and I started the foundation to give back to the community in his name because he was about education as well so tell us about that phone call that no parent ever wants to get bring us back to that day when you that know. day it was it was it was it was difficult because that day it started out with him and I arguing and it was like he was 
constantly using my um, Uber to take taxis. And I was like, you better stop using my Uber. And I was arguing with him on the phone. And then I said, you know what? I'm going to change it. So that day, he winds up taking the going to take the train home. And I always feel bad because I figure if I didn't argue with him about that Uber, maybe he would have took an Uber. But he was never in any type of trouble or had any problems with anybody in the community. So when I got home, I was like, okay, what I'm going to cook for him because he's about to come home from school because he's Mm -hmm. always in the house around 10 a.m. I mean, excuse me, 10 p.m. He's always home. So when I got the call and they said that he was um, shot, I didn't even think like shot with a gun. I was thinking like maybe he was in some movie shooting or something like that. And I, the phone dropped. So I just laid back down because I was like, that didn't come to my mind that he was shot with a gun it just did not come to my mind so then i got the call back and they was like no he was shot um and they're taking him it doesn't look good so i called my sister and i was in shock i guess because i called my sister and i said could you come and get me they said he got shot and when i got to the hospital my brother-in-law stepped out and he just shook his head and i just fell to the ground like don't tell me you shaking your head because he's gone and he was gone, so I didn't even make it to the hospital before he passed. And then when they let me see him, he was already tagged up with a tag on him, and it just it just oh, was horrible. Wow. What hospital was it at? It was in Brooklyn Hospital, so he actually was born in Brooklyn Hospital and died in Brooklyn Hospital. Oh, wow. Yeah. It's, 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 su- it's such a trauma to lose a person that you love, but to lose your child, I don't think people understand the trauma that you go through when you lose your child. And he was my only child, and I had nothing else of him to love. But um, almost two months afterwards, I found out that he had a baby that was born, so now I have a granddaughter, which is his only child. Amazing. I mean, it's, it's crazy, but there's a little piece of him that's there um to a certain and i thank god for that because it was difficult it was almost like i was going through post um post-mortem depression because he was gone and then i had this baby that i had to try to connect with but my son was gone and he didn't have that piece and it was like i couldn't connect it was like I was saying to myself, I love her because she's my son's child. But I wasn't feeling like I loved her because my son was gone. And after the, the a year went by, then the COVID happened. And I wound up having to keep her while I worked from home. And her mom, she worked into in, um, the health care. So I would have her more often. And now I feel like I love her because she's mine and not because she's his. So... It's, and it takes it's, time. It's, 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 it took it took a while, but um, it's good now. It's good. Did they ever find the person who committed the crime? Yes, they did. And the story behind that is a log story. Also, the person who killed my son was a young man that was twenty one years old. He had no dealings with my son. They weren't friends. They weren't enemies. They didn't cross paths with each other, and. When it first happened, I was saying, what could make a person's heart so cold that they could take another person's life that they don't know? And I was trying to get in contact with the family because I just wanted to know, like, Literally. you had to, un- I wanted to understand what it was. And um, I couldn't get in contact with anyone. And then when I came to know his own story, I will never understand why he took my son's life. But I understand why he had such a cold heart. To where he didn't love himself. So he could not care about anybody else's life. And I actually went during the sentencing. And I asked the judge if they could give him a second chance. And give him, not give him life. But um, give him time where he can go to a prison and get an education. Because he didn't have one. Where he can get an education. And hopefully in 20 years if he come out. Then he would be able to start with his child that he was leaving behind because we have to step in and break the cycle we cannot just constantly feel like you know i lost my child so i hate the world i'm hurt and i'm devastated but we have to break this cycle of young men and young people killing each other well hold that thought we'll take a quick break we'll be right back you're watching the unfocused tv stay with us Back. 
you're watching Beyond Focus TV. So, Michelle, you did something that I have to say. I'm sitting here listening to this, and I'm like, okay, would I literally, you have the opportunity to send this person away. Yes. Potentially for life. Yes. And you asked for a reduced sentence. And they took your only child. They took your one and only. Your past age where you can go miss, make another one. You know, it's yes. not like you could just go do that. As women, you know, there's limitations with certain things. And and it's not about replacing him because you can't replace him. Exactly. He could never be replaced. My issue with that was if it was my son, I would be on everybody's doorstep. The judge, the DA, everybody, please don't take his life. Please give him a second chance. Because when you're 21, when you're under 30, you do the dumbest things. When you're under 25, you do stupid things. You just don't think you don't care about anything in life and when you have a history of being going through so much changes in your own life whether i don't know if it could be you know you're not feeling love with your community you're not feeling love by your parents you're not feeling love by anyone you don't have no space to care about somebody else's life and i think at 21 you can make a mistake that it shouldn't have to take his entire life for it. And I know he took my son's life. And 20 years is a long time. And I think once he do 20 years and if he get the education that he can, he can probably come back out in society and become someone great. I mean, it's, my son is gone. There's nothing going to change that. And I love him more than anything. Nobody on this earth loved my child more than me. And it was a lot of people who didn't agree with me at the time, but my family has come around and they see what I did. And it had nothing to do with anybody. It had to do with me and the love I have for my child. That's also your little piece of forgiveness to a certain degree that you're not letting it, you're not harboring that. For me, it wasn't so much that it was forgiveness. It was for me that I felt like you can't love somebody with your entire heart while you hating another. And I love my son with my entire heart. I didn't want to know the young man's name. I didn't want to see his face. So when I went to court, I didn't look at him. I didn't listen to anything. I just came in. I didn't go through the trial. My family did the trial, everything. So I didn't hear all the background of how it happened, how many times he shot him, because he shot my son five times. So but, this was this was not a straight bullet. This was it wasn't accidental. It was no, it wasn't accidental. And when he spoke to the police officers, he said to them that my son was collateral damage. And I was like, well, what does that mean? What does that mean? Like, what does that mean? It has something to do with he didn't like a friend of my son's or whatever. I don't even know the whole story. If it was that, and I don't even care. My whole thing is my son is gone. Let me move forward. Let me try to raise his daughter. Let me try to save someone else's child. And all in my son name hopefully that child of the young man who killed my son won't grow up to be like his father or her father I don't know if it was a boy or a girl but it won't the child won't grow up having a cold heart like the father had and hopefully he's going into a place where it can't get no harder than what it is because you, you, you're, 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 you're gonna be in jail for 20 years and I'm fine with that I have no dealings with him. I don't want to know anything about him, what he's doing, how he's doing. And hopefully, he'll take and use this as a second chance. I mean, I respect it. It's it's hard. I could see why you're a fan. Because I'm sitting here like, there's a part of me be like, hey, you could die. You Hopefully, you would just stay in there and rot. But, and I just think but that 20 years is a long time. You could... He can come out of 40 and still have a good life. Exactly. He'll be, I think, about 40, 45, maybe, maybe somewhere yeah. in, in, in between there. And the world is going to be different in 20 years because it's constantly changing now. Correct. So hopefully he'll take that and he do it. And if he doesn't do well, he's not going to make it coming out in 20, in 20 years doing the same thing. You're not, you're not going to make it. So hopefully he will, and hopefully his child. I was more concerned about the child. I was hoping that the child don't grow up to have a cold heart like the father had. So right. my concern was about that little child at the time. And at the time of his sentence, I didn't even know I had a grandchild coming because I didn't find out until later. But um, it, go. It, it, it is, you know, God sent, sent the baby to me, and she's just like my son. She acts just like him. That's that's amazing. That's such a little blessing. So tell us about the foundation. 
Well, the foundation came about because when my son died, I was getting cards and envelopes from co-workers with money in it, and I didn't know what to do. I didn't want the money. So I had said, you know what? Give it to the school. Let's do a scholarship. So my sister and my um, family, they actually called John Jay and said I wanted to set up a scholarship. So I started the scholarship in his name for $1,000, and then I did $1,000 for an emergency fund. So we do that every year. And then the organization started evolving around that because my sister was saying, um, you're still a mother. Because I would say, I'm not a mother anymore. I don't have a child. I'm not a mother. And she's like, you're still a mother. You're still a mother. So we started giving out gift baskets to Mothers who lost their kids to gun violence on Mother's Day, and it was called "You're Still a Mother" gift relaxation gift basket, and then we just kept evolving from there. So now the organization we do a lot more of healing. We have a wreath memorial every year in August where people can come out and write love notes to their ones that they lost, and we tie it to a wreath. They can sing poems, sing songs. Um, just speak about that person then the next day we put it in the river to be repurposed everything is biodegradable so we have the scholarship we do that we do a lot of other things in healing we have a zoom program that we do where we have siblings cousins and friends children come to speak about the loss because a lot of times when you lose someone everyone is focused on the mom or they're focused on the parent or they're focused on the child they're focused on making arrangements and cousins siblings friends they have to deal with the grief on their own yeah so i have this where we could come and it's just about you know letting things out chatting and talking with each other and we do that um once a month oh wow so how's the reception with that and and of course with covid you know a lot has changed you have to do things virtually but it actually allows for more people to get together well, with COVID, yeah, we had to revamp a lot of things So, yeah. um, because a lot of our things is hands-on. So we started doing PPE, delivering them to the seniors and people who were um, disabled, giving it out in the community. We deliver food to seniors and people who are homebound. And then we started the Zoom with the um, the, the grief counseling. More, more, it's not so much of a grief counseling, but it's more of a talk. Co like and it's too. right, coping skills. So we do that. And that came in. It morphed because of the COVID through Zoom because a lot of times people's schedule is so busy. They can't come. They can't make it. But Zoom, you can be in your car and you can just log right on. So that helps a lot. That helps a lot. So we change a lot and a lot come from with funding. We don't really receive any type of funding. So what funding we were receiving, it just depleted because everyone is struggling. And um, most of our stuff is done out of my pocket my family pocket and even my sisters that's not by parents but by love they help keep funding the organization what is really really hard we don't get any type of funding because the way the system is set up mm -hmm. it's like a reimbursement when it comes to governmental funding so you have to spend your own money and then they give it back to you i will never have a million dollars to spend to give to a community and get it reimbursed even with the 501c3 with the 501c3 right you have to have that to get of a lot of the funding but it's reimbursement model and if you don't have it and then i wonder so do you really want to help our community because if i have to put up five hundred thousand dollars to really expand and do what we can do in our community and what we need how would I ever do that to get that back? So a lot of it you have to get through grants, but then if you're not well known, you can't hardly get a grant because it's like, well, we don't know what you have done, but then I can't do with so much because I don't have to fund it. So it's, it's like, exactly, exactly. It's, it's a real challenge. It um, really is. But what we'll do, we'll take a quick break. When we come back in the next segment, you're going to find out how you can support, how you can donate, and all that good stuff. So we'll put it out there and try to try to get some good vibes going. We'll be right back. You're watching Beyond Focus TV. Stay with us. you're watching beyond focus tv so michelle a lot is going on of course the foundation has been doing the best it can you can 
given the circumstances. Yes. Um, what do you have planned for 2022? I can't believe we're already saying 2022. I know. Well, I want to continue on with um, the foundation and doing a lot of the healing process and giving back in the community. I'm about encouragement and engaging the um, young adults and trying to get into education and programs. So I want to continue that. I want to expand it where we're going. Because right now we have... Um, we have worked it out to work with the Brooklyn Juvenile Detention Center where we go in and we take novels of black artists or minority artists, I want to right. say, minority writers, to have them to read them and to try to either see if there's any type of relations with their, of their own lives and the authors. So we're working with... Um, the um, Crossroads community, Crossroads Juvenile Center on that program. So I want to continue that and I want to start my second um, children's book because I did write a children's book called The Sky Has Caring Eyes and I did that because of my granddaughter. I didn't understand how I was going to explain to her that she would always be loved every day, all day long from a parent who she would never ever meet and who never got to meet her. And that is so hard to she knows of her father, but yes. she doesn't know her father. She knows him as living in the sky. So if you talk to her, she go, my papa live in the sky. And, That's you know, she you. has the book, and she always talks to him, and she knows that she can see him when she takes her to sleep. When she go to sleep, he comes to her in her dream. So that's how she figures she sees him in the photo. So I want to start on the second children's book in 22. So how has that experience been? authoring because I know you didn't venture out to to be an author it just things fall in your lap yeah everything fell in my lap the organization fell in my lap becoming an author fell in my lap um and it's exciting being an author it's like I mean putting stuff to your thoughts to pen and paper so many just fall right out and I, I, I love it because I can explain so much better to my granddaughter at her age, she's only three. She'll be four next month. But I can explain so much to her, put into the put in paper and put it in a book and then reading it to her. And it's like a better understanding. And then I want to think about doing a memoir also about raising my son and, you know, the difficulties that I had and then going through the trauma of losing my only child, working with other mothers. It's like things people say that they don't know how to say and mm -hmm. it's the wrong thing to say. So I would like to put, um, put efforts into writing something pertaining to that as well. And you touched upon this on one of the earlier segments, um, that it's not just the mothers who feel this, it's extended family. How has your mother, your parents are still alive, how has this been for them? Well, I lost my dad in 2005, so my mom is still alive. And everybody has been trying to be so strong for me. So I didn't really see how much that they hurt until it was maybe like a year ago. A year ago after my son's death and I started dealing with the Zoom now with the um, siblings and everything and one person said something about how they were feeling and I was like you know what because they said that they didn't cry and I never saw my mother cry and I was like do you love him I don't see you cry but she was trying her best to be so strong for me my siblings everyone they weren't crying because I was a, I was in pieces, so they was holding it together for me. But they did in their own way, and now I realize, you know, of course they love my son. Cheers on my name. Of course, he was the first grandchild. He was the first <laughs> nephew. Of course they did, and it's just that everybody was trying to keep it together for me because I I literally was in and out of the hospital. I was abusing um, my prescription drugs with alcohol. I drank alcohol for three years straight. I didn't stop drinking every single day until 2020 of October I was every single day I would drink vodka 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 like I just could that was the only way I can control keeping myself right to get well I thought that that was helping me keep myself together but it, I mean I'm more focused now that I'm not doing that anymore but um it was it was difficult 
It was I, I could only imagine. How do we get in contact with you? Because I want everybody at home to know how they could donate, support, maybe volunteer, offer their services. Because we have a lot of talented people in the community. So yes. they may not have the money, but they got the services and the talent. So and we'll we need it. the services. <laughs> we need the services. There's so many different things people could donate. They can help us with our website. They exactly. can help us. Graphic. They can help with graphics. There's so many different things because everybody that we have now is, is basically donating. And the foundation is a family organization and um it's my friends by love that's like my siblings my cousins my sisters but people can um go to our website which is um mja mja scholarship dot com dot excuse me dot org yep and we'll have it at the bottom of the screen right and then they can also go on our, tw our website um that's our website they can contact me um at mb anderson at the mjaf dot org, they can also call me three four seven seven one three two four four two. I'm always available. I mean, I'm constantly texting my my team at three in the morning. I'm like, well, you don't have to answer. Just call me when you wake up. So <laughs> I'm always available. They can contact me there. We have our uh, um, Instagram, which is um, Melquan underscore jaf. And also, we have our Facebook, Facebook, which is the Mel Quangetel Anderson Foundation. Amazing. Michelle, thank you so much for thank you sharing for having your story. Me. It's been an amazing 30 minutes with you just hearing, you know, the good that's come out of the little bit of heartbreak. And you'll never be 100%, but you're helping others. You have a lot to look forward to. So thank you so much i appreciate it. i'm honored to be here and um i just i look forward to working with you on other uh, we, other projects we thank will you. get you included for <laughs> sure and as always you have any questions or comments you can send us an email at info at beyondfocusmedia.com i'm your host lydia patel thank you so much for joining us and we'll be back again next week same time same place you're watching beyond focus tv stay with us beyond focus tv show wants and needs your feedback did we blunder? Please let us know so we can improve. Was the show helpful to you? Drop us a note so we can share the success with our staff members. Is there something you think we could do better? We welcome new ideas and new approaches to old ideas. Do you have a great suggestion? Let us know and we'll work on it. If you would like to share your comments anonymously, please send us an email at info at beyondfocusmedia.com. If you want to get in touch with the executive producer directly, send him an email at gene at beyondfocusmedia.com. We really look forward to hearing from you.